when I stepped into the drunken bar a slightly overweight guy in his mid-thirties with greasy blonde hair stood behind the counter. He shouted into the phone stop asking. We do not sell alcohol. We're at a brutal gaming store. Not a liquor store. He slammed the phone down and looked up at me. If you ask for whiskey or beer, he said, I'm going to throw these dice at you. He clinched a handful of twenty-sided dice. George told me to come, I said. About the I didn't know how to finish the sentence. The creepy moving statues. Ghosts. Paranormal shit. Aliens, the guy said confidently. He came out from behind the counter. George and the others think they're ghosts, or from some other spiritual plane, but they're aliens. He wiped his hand on his sweatpants and offered it to me. I reluctantly shook it. I'm Luke, he said. He raised his hands and gestured at everything around him. Proprietor of the fine shop you find yourself in. Seriously, the other store owners look down on me cause this is the nerd store. But I make bank. Dare officers should have been warning kids about magic the gathering cards, not drugs. Everyone else is in the back room. He pulled out a flask from within his sweatpants. You want a drink? I declined. He led me back. We sat in folding chairs arranged in a circle. There were stale donuts and lukewarm coffee on a table in the back. I felt like I'd unintentionally joined a support group. George was there. And Luke, obviously. Goth yogurt girl sat directly across from me. And to my sides was an old man with a patchy white beard and an Asian woman who looked about my mom's age. We should all introduce ourselves, George said. Explain why we're here. I'll start. Brian, as you know, I'm George. One of the day shift security guards. I first became aware of how he struggled to find the right word. Situation about two years ago. I was working an evening shift then due to the holidays. I walked into one of the employees only passageways to make sure our teens weren't sneaking into any of the storage rooms. According to my watch, he gestured to a Timex, I was there for less than 15 minutes. But when I came back into the main mall, I found out I'd been missing for three days. Lost time is a phenomenon commonly attributed to alien abductions, Luke said. All the others groaned. Stop it with the aliens, the Chinese woman said. She turned to me. I'm Susan. I own the massage parlor over by the JC Penny. Best Asian massage parlor in town, Luke said. Seriously. I keep reminding Luke, Susan said, despite my ethnicity, we primarily use Swedish techniques at my parlor. Yeah, racist, goth yogurt girl said. You're Asian and you run a massage parlor. Therefore it's an Asian massage parlor. I mean that's just a tautology, Luke said. That's not what a tautology is, I said. Whatever, Susan said. He stopped calling it an oriental massage parlor. Small victories. I'll hear whispers behind me in my shop. I can't tell what they're saying, but it sounds like they're right next to my ear. Telling me a secret in another language. The statues. George said you saw them move. I've seen them do this too. One night I stayed late to do the books. When I locked up, all the other shops were closed. I walked down the corridor to the door I was told I'd still be able to get out of. It's near one of the fountains with the statues. When I got to the end of the corridor it was strange. All the statues were missing. I thought maybe they got taken down for cleaning. It didn't make any sense to me to do that, but that made more sense than anything else. When I got near the door, I heard a sound behind me. Way down at the other end of the corridor I saw them. All the statues. And they saw me. I barreled through the exit and got in my car and left. I refused to come back to the mall for days. I told Mr. Jenkins about it. He assured me it was internet pranksters making a video. So I started coming back. But George and the others have convinced me something more is going on here. Everyone looked at Goth Yogurt Girl next. I don't want to talk about it, she said and folded her arms. Jenna, George said, it'd be good for Brian to. I said I don't want to talk about it, she said. Not tonight. George nodded. Is it my turn? The old man said. He didn't wait for anyone to respond. Mark Davis, he said. But from November and through December the 24th people here tend to call me Santa Claus. And oh boy, do I have a story for you. You got a minute. Good. Let me start. I used to be quite trim and fit and clean shaven, if you can believe it, and you'd better. Navy man. Sailor during Vietnam. I don't mention that casually. 
It's important to my story as you'll see. As I said, I used to be a trim and fit and clean shaven man. I was during wartime. From single quote 66 single quote 67 I was stationed on the USS Franklin D. Roosevelt or Swanky Frankie as we like to call her. Named after my least favorite president, but I proudly served on her all the same. For a period of several months, I was a night watch cook. Prepping food in the aft kitchen for morning breakfast as well as serving a late night dinner to my fellow night watchmen. So I can relate to you, Mr. Night Watchman Brian. Love that watch. I was a second class so I was in charge of the aft kitchen until Revali and my first class came down and took over. A hospital corpsman, who also stood the night watch, and I became good friends. We were both smokers, and the smoke deck was a lonely place at 0200. We'd meet out there, talk about what we missed back home girls mostly, bitch about what chain of command. For months we met and had these conversations. But one night my friend, Wallace was his name, had an odd look about him when he came to meet me for a smoke. Wallace, what's wrong? I said. A dream, he said. But he wouldn't elaborate further. The next night, again, Wallace had this sullen look about him. Again I asked him, what's wrong? A dream, he said. I told him that simply won't do. You must tell me about this dream. What has you down, Wallace? But he wouldn't tell me. Not that night. The next night, Wallace meets me at the smoke deck in his dress blues. He looks fine and sharp. But we're out to sea. No reason to be wearing that uniform unless you're going to captain's mast. I ask him if he's in trouble. None at all, he said. His eyes were glazed over. His voice monotone. In fact the night is a night to celebrate, I asked him what for. For the past few nights, I've been talking to this woman, he said. She's beautiful. The most beautiful woman I've ever met. And she loves me, Davis. And I love her. We're out to sea, I said. There's no women within miles of the ship. You're wrong, he said. She follows us, beneath the water. Wallace, you're sounding crazy, I said. She's perfect, Davis. In every way. She said she could hear me when I dreamed. Hear my thoughts. Hear my memories. Everything about me. And she loves me. Everything about me, Davis. In my dreams I've spent years with her already. It's time. It's time I go to her. He walked closer to the side of the ship. Don't go doing what you're thinking of doing, I said. I crept closer to him. Afraid of making a sudden move. Come with me, he said and offered his hand. I'm sure there are others like her beneath the water. One of them would hear your thoughts and dreams and think you're perfect too. Wouldn't that be so much better than this? I clutched his hand and tried to pull him away from the side of the ship. Tried to put him in a bear hug. I screamed, help on the smoke deck. I need help on the smoke deck. But while some of my focus was on getting help, Wallace's sole focus was on getting out of my grip. And he succeeded. He jumped. I called man overboard. But we never found his body. The smoke deck was aft. His body should have been swept into the propellers. Ground up right away. Would have left a pool of blood in the water. But we didn't see that. I will not bore you with all the details of my life from the end of the war until I became a mall center. But slowly I became less trim and fit and clean shaven. That's how these things go. My third year as center, first year at this particular mall, something happened. A girl was on my lap telling me about the puppy she wanted for Christmas when I looked up and into the crowd of parents and children waiting. What I saw it caused a reaction in me. I almost pushed the girl off my lap. Out in the crowd, towards the back, he was there. Wallace. Young as he was last I saw him. And he held the hand of a beautiful woman with long voluminous black hair. In front of them was a child they each had an arm on. Like they were posing for me. All smiles. Wallace waved when he saw me looking at him. Like he was just stopping by to see an old friend. The girl on my lap cried. I looked down at her and realized I had her hand in a death grip. She couldn't let go. Her parents ran up to me and ripped her away. When I looked back into the crowd, Wallace and his family were walking away. But the wife turned back. Her face was no longer beautiful. It was no longer human. Frame within her large black mass of hair were circular rows of sharp fangs like a lamprey eel. I yelled out to Wallace, to warn him. But he didn't listen to me. Jenkins threw a fit. The parents threatened to sue them all. 
He fired me. But next Christmas season, he couldn't find another Santa. He pays shit wages, and the mall's empty. There's not even a proper toy store, no offense Luke anymore, so hardly any parents bring their kids. He hired me back. That next year, I was in the restroom on break. Heard the rush of water all around me. Then saw Wallace crash through the ceiling and float there, like he just belly flopped into a pool. In his dress blues. He looked me in the eyes as he drowned. His body became bloated. Then it ripped apart a thousand baby eels tearing through his corpse. I got more stories like that and more. But you get the point, don't you, Mr. Night Watchman? After Mark finished his story, Luke passed him his flask. Mark gladly accepted it. There was a silence in the room then. Luke began to tell me about the time an alien appeared in his store and he hooked it with a broadsword, but he didn't get far into his story until George stopped him. Said maybe we'd all heard enough for the night. I got the sense that no one believed he was telling the truth anyways. We agreed to meet again in a few days. I wanted to talk to goth yogurt girl Jen, but she ran off as soon as the meeting was over. And George cornered me. I convinced Jenkins that I need to be on night shift too, he said. Told him more YouTube videos are trending. So if you stay on you won't be alone here at night. We can figure this out together. But why stay? I said. It's a dying mole. Why not leave it? What you heard tonight it's not even half of what's wrong with this place, George said. People go missing. Kids. What if they're out there somewhere? What if we can still save them? But can we save them? I don't know, George said. But what if it spreads? Say we do abandon them all. Maybe whatever's here stays contained within. Maybe it disappears. Or maybe it spreads. It bursts like a boil onto the rest of our community. Right now it's contained. It's finite. We can handle it. Stop it. If it spreads I'm not sure we'd be able to. So will you stay? Will you help us figure out what's wrong here and stop it? I didn't answer him right away. My eyes glanced around the room, trying to avoid his. But they found Mark's. He was listening to our conversation. Waiting to hear what I'd say. Yeah, I said. I'll help. I mean, Jenkins just gave me a 25 gift certificate for them all. If I don't help you guys, I won't have anywhere to spend it. I'll update you all later.